Good afternoon. I'm Kenneth Herbert. This is Matthew Burke, and this is Kelsey Williams. And we're going to talk to you about the increasing fuel efficiency of turbofan engines. Now, a brief overview of what we're going to go over. We're going to go over the history, the fuel consumption, the anatomy, the energy management, the six-stage process, real-world inefficiencies, and improvements that can be made in the future. A brief history of the turbofan. It was first invented April 1st, 1943, by the Germans. However, Americans, the Royal Sports Company, had the first production turbofan. And the turbofan today is the most commonly used jet engine in airliners. And this is because of its fuel consumption. 30% of all airliners' major cost comes from jet fuel, and it can fluctuate from 2 to $5 billion every month. And this graph shows just how dramatic those changes can be. Now, jet engines' efficiency is based on something called thrust-specific fuel consumption, TSFC. And the turbojet has the most efficient TSFC of all turbojet engines. And it's most efficient at 310 to 620 miles per hour, which is what airliners usually travel at. So. The anatomy of a turbofan, it's, it's two major parts, really. It has an inner core that is a turbojet engine, which is what we brought to show you today. And it has a fan. Now, the turbojet engine itself is where the fuel is burned and the bulk of the thermodynamic process takes place. And it has a very hot core of air that flows through it. And another cool thing about it is it powers the fan. Now, the fan is attached to one end, and it has a cooler bypass airflow that goes around the inner core. And it moves a lot of air, which makes it, the, it, makes it produce the most thrust of the entire turbojet engine. And as you can see here, we have a small graphic of how the air moves through the core and through the bypass. But the details on how this works will be better explained by Matthew Burke. OK, so the goal of any sort of jet engine is to try and produce as much thrust as possible with as little fuel as possible. And the turbofan accomplishes that by first compressing all the incoming air at the front highly, as you can see, that's on the handout too. While not really adding much energy, but it gives really velocity conversion all the pressure. And then after it's compressed, it does a uh, burn process, usually kerosene, that greatly increases the temperature at a roughly constant pressure, runs it through, and then ejects it out the back. And it goes through this in detail. Uh, the first step is actually, stage one would be essentially in front of this over here, the air that the airplane's moving through. And stage one to two is just where it hits the front of the engine, slows to a stop, and all the uh, kinetic energy is converted to extra temperature energy. In stage three, which is actually this entire portion here, is the compressor. And that's comprised of internal rotating rotor, which is potentially a turbine at back and then stators, which are attached to the shell. And the rotation of these two against each other actually produces a lift in such a way that highly compresses them. And the temperature increases along with compression as by idealized tropic law. And after it's compressed in the combustion chamber here, the fuel is injected, and obviously a burn occurs at roughly constant pressure, and a lot of temperature and energy. The, all the energy added into the system is added here. Afterwards, it goes into the turbine. For a turbofan engine, there's going to be two sets of turbines, actually. The first set is going to power the compressor for the turbojet core. The second set of turbines, which isn't on this, because this, this model is just a turbojet with no fan. The second set will power the fan at the front. Finally, for the turbojet core, all the excess energy that's left over from the turbine is ejected out the back at high velocity. Pressure and temperature drops greatly, but the velocity is massive, over 1,000 meters a second. Now, in addition, that secondary turbine set powers the giant fan, which is not on here, that will um, actually put about five times as much air through as the turbojet core itself uses and it's going to produce between 60 and 80% of the total thrust of the turbo engine. So the fan is where most of the thrust comes from. And here you can see again, hopefully this makes a little more sense now. The real world efficiency can be estimated by using isentropic constants found for experimentation. And this is either just basic equations so you can see 
uh, an ideal state. But it's essentially the real world of the ideal picture efficiency, so you can more accurately talk about it. And Kelsey Williams is going to talk about the attempts that have been made to improve efficiency. And So what we want is a more fuel efficient engine. And the process that Matthew described isn't actually, it's, it's an ideal process, but in the real world, not ideal conditions. So there's inefficiencies. And so we need to study those inefficiencies and make some improvements. Some major inefficiencies that I'm going to talk about are the high temperature effects on the turbine blades, and then the volume flow rate effects on the propulsive efficiency. The first one is the high temperatures versus turbine blades. Okay, so as Matthew describes, the temperatures can get really hot after the combustion process because an engine needs high temperatures to run efficiently. It needs high temperatures to produce great thrust. So the temperatures after the combustion process can reach, you know, upwards of the thousands, 1,526,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's like the boil, that's the melting point of many metal alloys. And the problem is turbine blades are made of metal alloys. So we need to figure out a way to, to cool them. Now, currently, methods are that they take free stream air from outside here, and they pass it through the blades, through these channels, inside the actual blades to cool them down. But free stream air isn't quite cold enough. So we've developed a project process called jet impingement. Jet impingement involves taking a very extremely cold coolant, liquid coolant, and pumping it through those channels in the turbine. And by force convection, this will make the, the blades colder. And also, we're developing more resilient metal alloys that can withstand the higher temperature. Now, we also have a problem with volume flow rate effects on propulsion efficiency. See, for the most efficient propulsion, we need a large volume of air moving through at a small rate as opposed to like a small volume moving at a very large rate which is the problem with the, the inner core of the turbojet because there's not a lot of air that can move through here and so it's, it has to it has to accelerate them at very high velocities to produce enough thrust that, that it needs. Now the bypass of the, of the, that the fan creates on the turbofan is, is help helping that because it, it can let more air go by and it doesn't have to speed it up as much. So we have to look at the bypass ratio, which is the ratio of the volume flow rate of the air going through the bypass to the, the rate of air going through the core. And we need to maximize that. Now one way we're doing this is we're developing ultra high bypass ratio turbo bands. And they're said to have bypass ratios twice that of current turbo fans. That means a ton of more air is moving through the bypass and there's much more thrust being produced. And high bypass ratio is equals lower thrust specific fuel consumption, so more, more fuel efficiency. Now what does this all mean? Is that more fuel efficient engines means less fuel that airliners have to pay to uh, have to pay for to you know go at the same speeds and everything. Now, less money that they have to pay means more money in our pocket. We're talking, I don't have any exact numbers, but a 25% increase in the bypass ratio could mean millions of dollars saved. And you know, that's a great thing. No any other questions? Uh, so I've got a couple of questions. Uh, what is the differential between the ideal and the real-world efficiency evaluation? Like what's the difference? It's actually pretty close. It's in the mid-90%. So okay. even doing an ideal simulation is not terrible. Okay. And it's not going to be hugely different. And my second question is, what happens when the material, when the parts of the fan either bend or melt, but the most of the fan remains intact? What does that do to it? It's destroyed. Yeah, pretty much. It, it can't. If any part of it is broken, it's such high velocity, it's working at such a fast rate that it's going to. Yeah. How exactly, when you improve the metals, like to withstand higher temperatures, do you know what what do they do to make that better? Do they 
incorporate other minerals that they wouldn't normally use that have higher melting temperatures or Current turbine blades are actually nickel super alloys that harden at higher temperatures. And so it's it's mainly just working on better alloys that, that have better high temperature characteristics. Um, could you could you go back to that image of the ultra high bypass ratio fan versus the high bypass ratio fan? Could you just explain what we're seeing in that image here? Um. <laughs> The, the, it's hard to see the colors, but the red one, the one that extends here, okay, is yeah. the, the higher bypass. Okay. It's got the figure yeah. in on it as opposed, I think this is a, a regular high bypass. There's actually a low bypass and a high bypass mm -hmm. and then an the ultra high bypass. Okay, so subtle, subtle difference so, to look so. at. Okay. Good, thank you.